you what, our heart is still right here as well. So we can, don't you love the fact that you can have uh, lots of family? Yes. Right? Yes. And one of the things I love is, is old friends, and that's what you guys are. You can't make new old friends, right? We're building a great congregation, and God's giving us great relationships and people of influence. Had the pleasure to, to offer the opening prayer on the floor of the House of Representatives just a couple of years ago. And uh, God's opening doors of influence, and it's, it's just incredible. But um, there's nothing like old friends. Amen. You don't have to be old to be old friends. Yeah. So right. it's okay. okay, let's jump to the scripture today. Turn to Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, my mic's popping. Do I need to do anything different with it? Or are y'all working on a good deal? We've got the best sound team in the world. Amen. Isaiah chapter 61. Turn there. And uh, we're going to read several verses, but I want you to turn to one. And I really know without a doubt that there's a word that I want to bring to you today. And for some of you, you're going to say, oh, really? Okay. Uh, that's heard that before. And others are going to be like, this is the first time I've ever heard it. Uh, but the apostles throughout Scripture tell us to be reminded of things that we know because we forget. Right. And some words are brand new to us, and some words are more significant because they remind us of things that we know and sometimes forget. And so Isaiah chapter 61, let's pray, and I'm going to jump in the saddle for the next 26 minutes and 45 seconds. Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to minister the word. We pray that you would open our hearts to what you want to do and what you want to say. I thank you for this great church, which is a well of living water that blesses the nation. And I pray, God, that you would speak to us personally, individually, and corporately, that you would break open something new in us and in this church and in this region. For this season in Jesus' name. And everybody shout, Amen. Amen. So today I want to talk about praise. Everybody shout praise. 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 Now, when you say, hey, we're going to talk about praise, you got two different camps. You've got some people who are like, praise, woohoo, yeah, we're doing it. You know, those are the people from the Happy Clappy Church, right? You were raised in a church like Triumph. And so when you say, I'm going to talk about praise, they're like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear. Praise God. Then you got the other folks, and I know because I grew up this way. And when you say, hey, we're going to talk about praise, then they are not, woohoo, they're like, whoa, what's yeah. going on? What are we about to do here? Because you may be from the smells and bells side of the faith spectrum, right? I know, because I was one. I was raised in a, as an altar boy in the Greek Orthodox Church. My dad is a Greek Orthodox. My mother was raised in the United Pentecostal Church. I would go as a servant as altar boy with the shells and the be smells of the bells and the sign of the cross and all that on a Sunday morning and then on Sunday night. They would run the hammer and beat it up, and we'd dance and run through the aisle. So many times as a young teenager in church culture, I didn't know when church was here, whether I was supposed to kneel or run. Okay. And so hopefully we got it right. Both are great. So there's something for everybody, but I want to, the, the title of my message is Raise a Hallelujah. And I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about praise, because I think it's very significant. In Isaiah 61, we see the prophecy that Isaiah gave about Jesus, the Messiah. And we know that what Isaiah gave hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ is about Jesus, because when Jesus showed up, he quoted, he read from the scrolls in the synagogue when he was beginning his earthly ministry, and he read this passage from Isaiah. And when he read it, he closed the book and he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. In other words, the things that we just read about are all talking about me. Yeah. And the things that this scripture promises, now we get to walk in it because it's talking about me. So Isaiah chapter 61, just three verses, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Everybody shout upon me. Upon me. In the south, you can even say up on me. The spirit of the Lord is up on me. Right? We need the Holy Ghost up on us. Not just up on us, but up on us. Uh, and it says, because the Lord has anointed me. Somebody shout, I'm anointed. I love this verse because it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because. We don't need to just read through that because there is always a function that comes with the anointing. There's always a reason the spirit of God comes upon a life. There's always a because. God's spirit doesn't come upon you just to make you feel great. He doesn't come upon you just so that you can feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. He doesn't even come upon you just so that you can be forgiven of your sins and made right with God so you can go to heaven when you die. But God's spirit comes upon us for mission. Yes. Mm. 
There's a mission, there's an assignment with the anointing of God when it comes upon your life. Teacher. And so Jesus said, here it is. The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, I love what he says. This is my message. He says, it's good news. Yes. Yes. Now, there are the world is full of bad news. And some would say it's full of fake news. Okay. But Jesus said, my message is good news. Yeah. That means if anyone is peddling a message in the name of Christianity, that is not good news, it's not gospel. It's not God's news. Because Jesus says, my news is good news. And what I'm proclaiming is something that warms every heart and brightens every life. Yeah. It's not a message of condemnation. It's a message of deliverance and liberty. He said it's to preach the gospel to the poor. And he goes on to say to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to those who are captives. And the opening of prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. He says, listen, this is my mission. You want to know what Jesus is about? He says, this is what I'm about. I'm here to preach good news. To set people free. To heal people who are wounded. To mend what is broken. To put all that is out of order back into back order. Into order. And that's encouraging because if anybody has uh, situations in life that are out of order or that are broken, you've come to the right place. Woo. Because the God that we serve is a God who loves to put okay. it Okay, preach it. There's no puzzle that's too hard. There's nothing too broken for him to mend. That's what he's about. There's no news that's too bad that his good news can't overcome. Jesus. He said, this is why the Spirit of God is upon me. And Jesus would tell us that he has sent us with the same Spirit, with the same anointing, with the same mission. Come on now. If you want to know what your purpose is in life, it's not a mystery. It's to preach good news to the poor. It's to find the broken hearted. It's to bring healing yes. for their wounds. It's to set people free. And then he says to, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In verse 3, he says to console those who mourn in Zion. And I love this. He says to give them beauty for ashes. He says to give them the oil of what? Joy, Joy for, mourning. for mourning. And then he says to give them the garment of grace for the spirit of heaven. He says this is what I'm about. And there's an exchange that happens. When you interact with me. Okay. You bring me your ashes. Yes. And I'm going to give you what's beautiful. Yes. You bring me your mourning. And I'm going to give you joy. Yes. You bring me your heaviness. And I'm going to give you a garment of praise. Amen. Somebody shout praise. Praise. Now this is important. Because I believe that our age is characterized by a spirit of heaviness. Yeah. Yeah. Here, let me just stand this too. See, we can have a praise break right now. Uh huh. Woo. It's okay. I've got 20 minutes to get you there. Thank you, Jesus. Our age is characterized by a spirit of heaviness. If you look socially at what's happening around us in our relationships, personally, interpersonally, and then globally, mm -hmm. nationally, there's a spirit of heaviness. If you look at our political climate, can I get a witness? Yes. There's a spirit of heaviness. There's divisiveness. There's strife. Yes. There's, conten there's contention. Yes. There is a war going on. There is a fight. There are people who are entrenched in positions, and there's a gulf between them, and there is heaviness that is upon the people because no one can come together. Together because of a spirit of heaviness. Even spiritually, if we're not careful, there's a cynicism that can come upon us that is a product of a spirit of heaviness where we look and we scoff at God. We don't necessarily do it outright, but we proclaim faith, yet we act as if we don't need faith. Okay, teach it. There is a spirit of heaviness. And heaviness here in the Hebrew means a dullness, a colorlessness. It means a lack of vibrancy. It means a lack of life. It describes the wick of a candle when it's just about to go wow. and it's flickering. Wow. Literally, it means, some translations will say, instead of a faint spirit, but it means an extinguished spirit. Are you like me? Have you ever experienced the feeling that my spirit is just extinguished. It's just faint. Yes. It's just heavy. My life just lacks color. It lacks the vivid colors of God's grace sometimes. The world is filled with heaviness. Yes. 
And if we're not careful, the Spirit of God may be in us and up on us and all around us. But you can get in circumstances and we can get around people and in environments where that spirit of heaviness can come upon us. Mm -hmm. Depression, suicidal thoughts are, 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 are high in our culture today. All of these things are Jesus. symptoms, hopelessness, anxiety of a spirit of heaviness without vibrance. And a spirit of heaviness darkens our countenance. Mm -hmm. It causes us our vision to be dimmed. It robs us of our hope. It isolates us. It causes us to feel alone. It's a heavy, oppressive feeling that can come upon us. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that it is a spirit of our age. It is a spirit of heaviness. And it will rob us of our life with God. Does it mean that we won't go to heaven? Does it mean that we won't? make an impact, but it means that life can be like trudging through mud when you're overcome by a spirit of heaviness. But the good news is God has a remedy. God has a remedy for the spirit of heaviness. And he says, listen, I'm going to preach good news to the poor. I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted and I'm going to take your ashes and give you beauty. I'm going to take your mourning and give you joy. And here's the remedy for the spirit that plagues our society and even the church today. He says, I'm going to take your heaviness and I'm going to give you a garment of praise. Somebody yes. shout praise. Praise. I'm going to give you a garment of of praise. Now remember, I told you some of you are like, oh, pastor, are we really going there? I've heard this before. Listen, just because you walk in and you know the socially acceptable norms of a spirit-filled church, which means when I walk in and the music is hot, then I know that I need to clap, occasionally praise, move from side to side. That does not mean you are praising God. All right. All it means right. you are going through motion, but yeah. it does not necessitate, it does not equate praise. Because you can come in and hear all the good music and sway from side to side and clap a little and leave just as heavy as you came in. But God's remedy for the spirit of our age, which would transform our city and our church and our nation, mm. is called a garment, a garment of praise. Now, here's what I want you to know about that. Number one, it is a garment. Everybody shout a garment. Garment. Praise is a garment. It's something that you wear. The spirit of heaven is a garment. Is a cloak, mm. it's a coat, it's a mantle, it is something that you put on. Listen, if praise is a garment, you have to make a choice. Yes. You have to make a choice to take off the garment of heaviness and put on the garment, garment of, praise. of praise. You have to put it on. Secondly, it's a garment of praise. Now listen to this. It's not a garment of worship. It's a garment of praise. praise. Now stick with me for a minute. Now, theologically, I know that worship is all of life. Worship is not just the slow songs and praise the fast songs. In fact, the first time worship was ever mentioned in scripture, there were no musicians, there were no singers, right. there was no church. It was Abraham and Isaac, and they went up to the mountain to worship God, which means they were ready to sacrifice in complete obedience to everything they had. That's what worship is. Mm. Okay, but for this message, what I am differentiating is that there is a spirit of praise, there is a garment of exuberant joy and praise. That is the remedy for a spirit of heaviness. It is a garment and it is a garment of praise. It is not a garment of worship. What I mean by that is that worship is internal. It is responding to who God is. But praise is something I do. I'm going to say that again because I know Come this on. is triumph, y'all. Tell me this ain't hard to preach this type of a message of triumph. But this is what God wants us to hear today. Okay, come on. Praise is something I do. Worship is a response to who God is. But when I praise God, I praise God for what he has done. done. Yes. I praise God for what he has done. Some of the old songs say, oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. I'm saying this because I'm a little concerned in our modern way of doing church and in our modern movement of worship that we have left or diminished the role of praise mm. to exalt the role of worship. Right. That we have in some way, because we're more comfortable to lift our hands and sway from side to side, we have missed 
the praise, the exuberance, the expression of thanking God for what he has done. Yes. And in doing so, we have allowed ourselves to be victims to the spirit of heaviness. That's praise great. is a garment, and it is a garment of praise. Because the higher you go in praise, the deeper you can go in worship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm in churches, and I walk in, and they start the service, and it's with some slow, swaying song. And they missed it. Not that it's not a bad song, not that you can't connect with Jesus, but they missed the principle of praise. The principle of rejoicing in who God is, and not only that, but what he has done. You see, worship is vertical. It's between me and Jesus. I don't need you to worship. But praise is horizontal. Praise is contagious. We need a community to praise. The scripture says, come on, let us praise the Lord together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name yes. together. In fact, we see this, this pattern in scripture where we praise God with joyful exuberance. And then we move into worshiping God. In Psalm 95, it says this. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Is that, is that fast or slow? Is that loud or soft? Come on, you guys are, you, you're smart people. <laughs> Let us come before the presence. Next verse. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us what? Shout, Shout joyfully. joyfully with songs. And then what does it say? Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. down. Let us kneel before, before the God, our maker. Our maker. Mm. Do you see that flow there? We go high in praise so that we can go deep in worship. Mm. Worship is a response to who God is, but praise is for what God has done. Yeah. The third thing is that praise is outward. Everybody shout outward. 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 Praise is an expression. You can't praise the Lord with your lips locked. You can't praise the Lord and not move. You can't praise the Lord and stand still. Praise is an action. Praise is motion. Praise is expressive. Hebrews tells us, let us offer to God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. The fruit of lips that worship him, that profess his name. Amen. If you look in the Old Testament, when they were given prescriptions as to how to uh, prepare the garments of the priests that would come into the presence of God. They were instructed to sew bells into the lining of the priest's garments. And Josephus, who is a historian who lived during the time of Jesus, chronicled that Old Testament history and said that there are perhaps more than 75 bells that would have been sewn into the garment of the priest when he would come into the presence of the Lord. Do you know that means that the priest of God could not move without making a that he could not move Ooh. without worship and praise and celebration and music happening. Right. One of the most significant decisions I ever made in my life was the decision to praise God. Yeah. To praise God because praise is a choice. Yes. Now, sometimes in church, you know, the preacher will say, well, in the Greek it says this, in the Hebrew it says that. Have you ever wondered why preachers do that? It's not just so we can look smart. <laughs> but it's because the original New Testament was written in Greek and the Hebrew was written and the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And these are very dynamic languages. So in the Greek, for instance, the Greek language has four times the number of words that the English language has. That means for one word in English, you can have potentially four words in Greek. An example of that would be the word love. How many, what is love in English? Okay, there you are. You tracking? Okay. Love tracking. Is, now, you have to be careful because we don't believe that love is love. That slogan, right? But love in English is the word love. In Greek, it could be agape, which means an unconditional, self-sacrificing, totally giving love without any strings attached. It's the love that God has for us and that we as believers should have for one another. 
Or we could choose the word eros, which is where we get the word erotic. Everybody shout erotic. Erotic. First time at it, we're having a choice. <laughs> and you know what that means, right? But then there's also the word phileo, which is a brotherly love. It's a, it's a companion love that is not with sexual attraction or lust, but it's a brotherly companionship love. But all of them in your Bible are translated in your New Testament as the word love. Now, the Hebrew is even more broad than the Greek because Hebrew is a pictorial language. What that means is that every letter in Hebrew is a whole message within itself. That not only are there potential words, more words for that Hebrew letter, but every Hebrew word really would take a phrase or sometimes even a paragraph to describe fully what it means. But in the English language, we get one word. Now... What is the largest book of your Bible? It is the book of Psalms, 150 chapters. And what is the main focus and theme of the book of Psalms? Praise. The central message in the largest book of God's inspired word is about praise. I think there's something important there. Because praise causes us to break the spirit of heaviness in our lives and off of the lives of others. So what I want to do in the next five minutes is I want to give you seven Hebrew words for praise which give us expression as to how we can shake off the heaviness of our age and walk and put on the garment of praise. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, hallel. Everybody say hallel. This is hallel. where we get the word hallelujah, and it means to rave, to boast, or to be clamorously foolish. When the Astros won last night, I was sure that many of you sat, see, y'all can't even be quiet in church. Okay, okay. Many of you were like, oh, great, we're going to the series. <laughs> No, you raved, you boasted, you were clamorously yes. foolish. <laughs> you praised, if you will, the Astros. Mm. You did something. Mm. You moved. Mm. You shouted. You raved. You boasted. Number two, yada. Not Yoda, but yada. yada. Yada means to extend your hand. It means to acknowledge in public. public. It's the opposite, literally, of wringing your hands. It's taking your anxiety and turning it into praise. Woo. That's good. But yes. it's public. Everybody shout public. public. Now, I know many people, um, you know, the other day I tried this. I, I said, honey, I'm about to go. I've got a couple of meetings. I've got, I've got a council uh, and have a lunch meeting with this couple and this other woman. And here, look, I'm just going to put my wedding ring right here <laughs> on the counter. And I'm going to go out on my day. And when I get back, I'll come back in the evening and I'll put it right back on. Right? Mm. That wouldn't Didn't work. Think she let me leave the house. She would have tripped me before I got to the door. Because we all know that a covenant is public. Okay. It's not private. I can't say, oh, well, you know I love you. You know we have this thing going on. It doesn't matter if everybody else knows it or sees it. Our relationship with God is likened unto a marriage covenant. Right. And to praise God right. means to yada God, which means to do it in public. Woo. To let everybody know. That is so good. I just determined I refuse to give more praise to a sports team that will never okay. know my name than the the universe who found me, who rescued me, who lifted yes. me, who is with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why is it okay to do this everywhere else but in church? Mm. And I used to say, Pastor, we're triumph, and we know how to praise. <laughs> I know that we were founded in that way, and I know that we know how to praise, but I don't know that we praise at the level that we need to praise to break the spirit Woo! of heaven. I'm concerned it can become cultural, it can become automatic, it can become habitual, and we can walk in and praise, praise. but leave with a garment of heaviness. Barak, to bless by kneeling or bowing, to present yourself yeah. expecting to receive something from God that you don't already have. Is another word translated. All you're going to see in your psalm is praise. But it means to kneel or to bow. Zamar, making music to God with strings. Aren't you thankful for our band here today? Yes. Yeah. I love it. As I interact with people in Washington, D.C., and they don't have 
uh, any background of church. They're very educated, very affluent. And it's interesting to watch as they experience one of mm -hmm. our spirit-filled services. And they're like, oh, this is kind of cool. I love that's kind of neat that you guys <laughs> are your current and have like a band and drums. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of cool. You know, you're like mm -hmm. trying to be hip and stay modern. I said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We don't have a band because we're trying to be relevant. Thank we you. don't have drums because we got delivered from church without drums. We have musical instruments because the Bible says God wants to be praised with musical instruments. Okay. And when we beat the drum, when we play the keys, when we strum the guitar, it's an offering of praise to God. You see, I don't praise God. I don't lift my hands because it's cool. I don't lift my hands because everybody else is lifting it. I don't shout or clap or dance because that is something that is cultural or that is according to my faith background or how I was raised. But I do it because that's how God says, if you're going to praise me, this is how I want to be praised. Yes. You, yes. don't to, you don't get to praise God any way you want to praise God. And that's why we're bound. Yeah. Oh, Pastor, you don't know. I'm an introvert. <laughs> really? Hmm. God created your introvert self and still told you to praise Him okay. with a loud voice. <laughs> and the lifting of the hand and the shouting of the hand. Because He knows what you need is to praise Him and to be delivered from what you need. Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. I, I'm convinced that some of our chronic social emotional conditions could be totally relieved yes. if we would relearn how to praise God. Relearn how to praise God. I'm convinced God. that if we could just get a little bit of air between the floor mm. and our feet, it might lift our spirit and our emotion. Ooh. I'm concerned that if we just put our hands together with purpose and with okay. pity, and if we allow our praise to be yes. as great as it was for the Astros last night, that something could break in our church, that yes. something could break in this, in this city, that something could break in our nation if God's people would shake yes. off the garment that everybody else is wearing and put on the garment of praise. When you walk into Walmart, when you go to your cubicle, when you go to your refinery and you put on your jumpsuit, what if your jumpsuit was lined with praise? <laughs> What if your slot it. or whatever you wear to your place of employment was lined with praise and everybody else was wearing heaviness, but you got a little hallelujah in the car before you got to work today. You took a little air time in church on Sunday morning and you discovered the presence of God and the power mm. of praise. Shabbat number five, to address in a loud tone, to shout with a voice of triumph. Again, your favorite sports team. Touchdown. That was great. <laughs> your friend that you haven't seen in years comes and you go to, you go to pick them up from the airport. They come through the gate and you're like, good to see you. How you been? You wouldn't even think about doing that. And I'm saying the God of the universe deserves more expression yes. than we would give. You didn't save me. You, did, you don't know where I was and where God brought me into. I look nice now. I've got some, some education and some money and some clothes and I live in a great city. But you don't Woo! know the battles that I've fought in the middle okay. of the night that I've had to slip out of the bed and start walking and start praising and put on some music yes. and say, okay, God, it's you and me. Time for a praise party. You see, I've gotten real good at having a pity party, but what I need to relearn, can I just be honest with you and just share with you myself, what I need to learn again is, is how to have a praise party. Yes. I allowed the spirit of heaviness to come on me uh, the last couple of days and just was kind of hum-hum, and I would you know, talk to my wife, because she's my wife, and she's the best thing that's ever happened to me next to Jesus, and, and I could just talk all about it and all that. And then finally, I came in here last night, and I walked in this sanctuary, and I began to do what I know to do, even when I don't feel like yes. doing it. Yes. And there wasn't anybody in here, but boy, these walls were shaking. And it's something about it that when I started doing what is, see, sometimes, most times, it's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Yes. You better not wait to show love until you feel love. 
you better show love and know that the feeling will come. Yes. The same thing is true with praise. We don't praise because we feel like it. We praise because as we praise, then we begin to feel like it. And God delivered me and he lifted that heaviness and he gave me a garment of praise. Why is it normal in every other place but in the house of God to lift up the praise that is rightly due him? Can I tell you that I learned how to praise in this church? And what made this church great and what makes this church great is people who know how to praise. Because when you praise... Demons tremble. Hey, yes. When you praise, it is impossible to give God a biblical praise and stay bound. It is impossible to give God a biblical praise and stay depressed. It is impossible to give God a biblical praise and stay rattled with anxiety. When we praise, the demons tremble and the heavens open and we are exchanged and we give our beauty, our ashes for his beauty yes. and we give our mourning for his joy and we give our for his praise. Thank you. Number six, toad off to lift your hands in adoration, even for things that you don't haven't received. Oh, yeah. I love it. We get all kinds of explanations. Why do you raise your hand in the church? And we get all these cute explanations, which are great. I have no problem with You know, oh, we're just like a little kid. You know how a little kid says, oh, pick, pick me up. I say, oh, pick me up, Jesus. Oh, pick me up, Jesus. Oh, are you going to help when somebody puts a gun in front of your face? You need to <laughs> So we come to church and say, Jesus, I surrender. That's all right. I don't have any problems with that. But that's not why we lift our hands. Okay. Do you know why we lift our hands? Because God likes it. Yes. Right. And he's God, and I'm not. And I think I'm going to do what he likes because he knows what I don't know. That when I lift my hands, my heart is lifted. That when I lift my hands, the chains fall. That when I extend my hands, yes. when I bow to God, when I adore God, when I lift my hands in, my, in his sanctuary, I am set free. Yeah. Number seven. Now I'm wrapping this up. Because here's thank what we're going to do. I'm about to break the spirit. Thank that you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. We're about to have a praise. Thank you, Lord. Woo! My Lord. We're going to give you about half a song to cuddle up, we used to say that. Right? And what that means is to just <laughs> praise God. Because I don't want you to leave with a spirit of heaviness. And I believe this. I believe if we would remind ourselves of what we know. And we would do what we know to do. Remind yourself God, of what you're yes. Mm, yes, he will. Number seven, tequila. Everybody shout tequila. Tequila. Not tequila. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. I knew it. I know some of y'all are like, Pastor, I done <laughs> found my scripture. Uh, tequila. <laughs> <laughs> means exuberant praise. Exuberant. Look at I will extol the Lord at all times, and his tequila <laughs> will always be <laughs> on with us. Yes. God is taking care of Yeah. is extended from eternity down to where we are. And his authority and his reign yeah. and his rule dispels darkness and brings life when we praise him. Yeah. 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 The mm. people of God were surrounded by armies and the, the leader said, send out, King Jehoshaphat said, send out the praisers. That's right. That's right. He didn't say send out a whole bunch of people with their eyes closed, swaying from side to side at half mast. That's right. He said, send the people who know how to how raise to the Lord. Yes. Yes. Deliverance yes. Thank you, Lord. Woo. Jesus is the lion of the tribe. Yes. Oh. Listen, I love y'all. And I love all the slow songs. And I love all that stuff. And I can sit up in Jesus' lap and cry a tear. And have all that time that Woo. I need. But Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Yes. And Judah does not mean worship. It means praise. He is the lion 
is, is not just for this church and maybe not just for you, but it's for a nation. And as I listened to you pray last week, I know they probably made you write that down and they had to approve it and everything else. But it didn't matter because when I listened to you pray, I listened to a lot of prayers over the House of Representatives and over this nation. But when I listened to you pray the other day, man, I began to feel something. And I began to, I don't want to even say feel something, something changed. It's not about our feelings, something changed. And all of you are a part of that. I'm saying it because you were the one there. But when you were standing in that place in front of that lectern, something shifted in the spirit when you began to pray and you began to pray for unity and you began to pray for God to shut the mouths of the divisive things that were going on and I want to pray over you today over your family that when you go back your church is going to be different and, and your kids are going to be different and the concern that we've talked about over the past few years of what the future means that the concern is Jesus and Jesus alone and I believe that God is moving in your behalf and there's going to be a change because there has been a change even as you prayed here last night. You said it changed. I said it to Pastor Angel this morning. There was a spirit of heaviness over me, some things that the uh, people that, that are just needing God and needing healing and so many things. But it's shifting. It's shifting. Everybody say it's shifting. Father, in the name of Jesus. We unite our faith today with this precious family. God, not just because we love them and not just because they are so important to us, but God, but because the task and the, the, the task that you've called them to, the assignment that you've called them to, God, is it's not just to have a church in on Capitol Hill. It's to be a difference maker. It's to shape the nation. It's to shape the life of those that are making decisions. God, I declare right now peace. I declare right now victory. I declare right now, God, abundance and provision over their lives. God, I pray for Danielle and Nate that as they move into these next places of their life, of adulthood and teenagehood, God, we see what you did with John. You're going to do it even more so with them. And their anointing is increasing. The anointing of the children. The anointing of these parents. God, I pray that because every beat of their heart and every breath of their lungs is called and ordained of you, God, I speak life and abundance and provision and power. We speak power. We speak power. In the name of Jesus, we declare the Amen and amen. Come on, would you guys enjoy the Christmas together with us? And I know we were working in the service, so I want to just pray for all of you and bless you. But we do have water baptisms taking place, and this is, this is a product of praise. And the life change we're going to see. So actually, if you're ready to be baptized, why don't y'all go ahead and make your way over here. I want to encourage you as a church family, if you want to hang out, celebrate the baptisms with us, hang out to speak to Pastor Zane and Christine Skaven for just a moment. And then also, we're going to be dedicating Ace of Paul Jones over here, so the family wants to get ready for that. We're just having a lot of our church and people on the stage of this time. So we're back in the ready. Why don't you lift your hands as I bless you? Father, we just thank you for your might. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you for your undeniable spirit in this room. I pray for every single person in this room who laid down a garment of negative stuff. That they would refuse to pick it back up. They would walk out of here free with, with a pure emotion of, uh, of gratitude and thanksgiving and the ability to walk and move in this, God, that this isn't just a moment for today, but that tomorrow things are shifted, and the next day things are shifted, and the next Sunday when we get back together, the stories and testimony of what's happened just over this week, we'll break through these walls. We praise you for it, we love you. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. We love you guys. We're going to stay friends for a little bit.